Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the house of worship. We gather once again in the name of the Lord. World has changed a little bit. We are entering into the last two months of this year, 2020. And like from the beginning, this year has given us surprises and we come together with only one um, thought, that the world around might change. And I might be ushering you into my reflection this morning. It's not going to be a sermon, but just a reflection. World around us changes. But the one who has called us doesn't change. The one who claims us as his children doesn't change. The one who died for us and became our savior doesn't change. And I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in his name, I greet you this morning. Looking at our announcements, they are just pretty well what we have been going through. Uh, do we need any other information on that fall silent auction, Ginny? Okay, and then um, it was decided by the uh, Sunday School Continuing Education or Christian Education Committee that we will not have the Thanksgiving Eve service this year, again because of the attendance and for people just to be safe, uh, but there will be uh, Thanksgiving reflection coming your way. So. Uh, hopefully you will be able to watch that and listen to the thanksgiving aspect of our faith that needs to be always in the forefront. It seems like we are still in need of some volunteers here and there. If you can do your part, we will appreciate that. And uh, we celebrate birthdays this week. Uh, Ariel uh, Mattingly, she gets to celebrate her birthday. God bless you, dear. And Dana had a birthday on the 10th. So may God continue to uphold both of you in his grace. And we don't have any wedding anniversaries uh, listed here. I also would like to take a moment and bring us all together in offering our prayers and sympathy to Gary and Jackie, uh, the Stout family, the Mays family. Uh, keep them in your prayer. Tomorrow is the graveside services, burial. And I know that the trauma of death is something to bear, but when you lose two of your loved ones, family members, uh, in whatever circumstances, you know, it always is that experience that lives with us throughout the life. And the faith of believers, always makes a difference. And I encourage you to continue to keep this family in your prayers, uh, comfort and peace that we send in their way. And I know that they cherish their relationship with the family here. Okay, any other announcements that we have? Tina, I know you have something to share. You have something to share? Um, yesterday, I printed off a David's 21-day uh, gratitude journal, and I'm going to start it tonight. And if anyone is interested, just see me after church or email me or text me. OK. Ginny?
Okay, thank you. Yeah, Don? Okay. Okay, if no other announcements, then let's begin our uh, worship service. If you are able to stand, we will read this responsibly. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beatitude speak to us about the human emotions that define us as people of God. Prayer of confession, we can read this together, please. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Words of assurance. Beatitudes are blessings with note of happiness in the presence of the Lord. When you have faith in the living Savior, you reach out to make peace. Keep the taste of God's love alive in your daily living. Pray for those believers who face death each day because they believe in Christ. What are your struggles? Bring them to the Lord. Amen. You may be seated, please. And our hymn, Rock of Ages. And now our prayer concerns, joys and celebrations. Do we have anything? Yes, George. Uh, Madeline was accepted into the master's program for her criminal justice and psychology. Okay. Very good. Okay. Others? Yeah, Barb. Okay. Others? Yeah. Um, Brittany was in a car accident Tuesday evening. Um, somebody ran a stop sign on 24 and West and Blacktop, and she seized over them. But um, she had a lot of bruises, and her um, elbow was really 
swollen but not really swollen. They said she was very fluffy. Okay. And I'd like prayers for um, my sister-in-law, Jane. Um, we prayed for her daughter, Jackie, who had a stroke. She died two and a half weeks ago. So celebration of life is today. Okay. Others? Yes, Mary, Mary Ellen. Okay. Let's bow our heads at this time, then come to the Lord. This is our time of reflection, time of quietness, time of making an effort to connect our thoughts with our Heavenly Father. It's time of prayer. It allows us to be humble, to be joyful, to be celebrating each and every life that we come across. David, though he was the king of Israel, each time he had an opportunity to go to the house of the Lord, he was in a very jubilant mood. He danced, he sang, and he praised God. So much so that his wife was kind of ashamed of him. But he didn't care. He knew the holy presence that he is entering into. Sometimes maybe we need to take time and do that in our spiritual well-being. These moments of Sharing of joys and concerns are just like a procession. We bring all those celebrations, thanksgiving, healing, empowerment, words of comfort, prayers of peace to the Lord irrespective of who is watching us and how we enter in the presence of the Lord. It doesn't matter. Lord hears our prayer. Divine and gracious King of the universe, our Creator and Savior, you provide for us, you sustain us. And you have very well planned our lives, not only on this earth, but in your kingdom. And Lord, you give us a calling to live that life of faith in such a way that through our words and actions, always and everywhere, your name be glorified. Heavenly God, this morning your children have brought their prayers of celebrations, their prayers of concern for their loved ones, those who are still at home, those who are undergoing through treatments, And those who have only your grace to look towards in time of comfort and peace. And these are the prayers of sympathies, Lord, that we send, especially for Gary and Jackie and 
the whole Stout family. And for Jane, who lost her daughter, others who are going through times of trials and maybe a challenging life ahead of them, long process of treatments. And we celebrate with George, proud father achievement for his children and each aspect of blessing that you send in our way. Lord, we also lift the prayers of blessing for those who are celebrating their birthdays this week. May the empowerment and strength of faith that they need each year as they reflect on the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that you will empower them, make them your faithful witnesses. And then we make an effort to pray for our families, oh Lord, we are still going through a lot of turmoil, a lot of anxiety, especially on behalf of the children. The world is changing and they really either are part of the change and still trying to accommodate what it's all about. We pray for this pandemic that has taken its toll, not only through death, but through emotions and worries. People are still being laid off and families that are struggling at this time. And now, we as believers have work to do. We continue to pray for our leaders, for their wisdom, for the guidance, so that they will have something planned in a way that will benefit this nation. Also, Lord, this week we are going to remember our veterans. They have done their part. They have contributed to the freedom of this country. Their lives are valuable to us. And as during this week, so many different occasions and times on that particular day, when people will be gathering to pay their respects and also encourage people to support wounded warriors and wounded veterans and get involved in this kind of ministry. What a time of uh, service we have ahead of us. Thank you for their lives. Thank you for their sacrifices. And so, Lord, be with us. During this season of Thanksgiving, may our thoughts always be focused on the salvation, the gift of salvation that you have sent in our way, in your Son, Jesus Christ, because it is in his name that we ask this prayer. He also has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And do we have any kids? We don't, so let's skip that, and we come to our tithes and offerings. Um, you want to play doxology for us, please?
O Lord of blessings, you keep watch on our needs and send provisions in our way. Our gifts in your presence this morning speak of our heart, heartfelt thanksgiving. Accept these and us. We pray that the ministry of this church continue to bless many. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as, as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became one as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being without law toward God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win, the, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. As I mentioned in the beginning, that today is it's just a reflection. It's not going to be like pointers one, two, three, four, five. Because the letter to the Corinthians is more or less like a how do I want to say it? It's administratively theological reflection. On one hand, Paul is trying to regulate the church code for the Corinthians who are not Jews. And at the same time, he wants to make sure that the gospel is not lost. And I guess sometimes in our churches as United Methodists, we see that struggle. There is a small uh, example um, from the Charlie Brown cartoon. Nancy is jumping the rope and she is saying, one, two, Velcro my shoe. Three, four, automatic door. Five, six, computer chip. And her companions, you know that bunch of kids around her, they interrupted her and said, Nancy, that's not the way the rhyme goes. And Nancy says, I know. But these things have to be updated from time to time. These things have to be updated from time to time. And reflecting on that, there's another cartoon that I observed, Calvin and Hobbes. There's a conversation going on between these two. And Calvin is telling his imaginary friend, stuffed tiger Hobbes, nothing is permanent. Everything changes. That's one thing for sure I know in this world. And then in the next box, he says, but I'm still going to gripe about it. Changes are hard to handle. Changes challenge us. Challenge, uh, changes also bring out the creative aspect of our faith, whether it is dealing with the administrative issues of life or dealing with the faith issues of life. Change 
always takes place. The challenge in such times that we are going through and have gone through these past eight months, churches are being affected by these changes. Just yesterday I received an email from the conference that one of the United Methodist Churches in our conference has decided to not be United Methodist. They're walking out of the conference. They're breaking their relationship. Maybe they have had enough. And uh, Bishop sent out an email of prayers for these changing times. Changes are a rhythm that come in our way each day, each moment. And the kind of decisions that we make bring about the positive and the negative side of our life. What worked for my parents didn't work for me, didn't work for the children, and now for the grandchildren. Actually, last week, my niece-in-law in Canada, she's doing a subject on journalism. I don't understand that, but she called me last week that she wants to have an interview with me because she's doing an article uh, on my life uh, from teacher to preacher. And she needed all those little bit snippets here and there and um, what led me to the ministry and my positive uh, experiences, my negative experiences, what has changed. And the last question that she asked me was uh, for the present age children, based on your journey, uh, what kind of thoughts will you leave for them? And I said, well, life is an investment. It depends on what kind of currency you bring into this life, how many deposits you make, what kind of deposits you make, and what you put in your body, in your mind, in your thoughts, in your actions, uh, that gives you the dividend. And the challenge in front of the children nowadays is a lot of choices. We didn't have those choices. And out of those, what they choose becomes their deposit and their investment. I guess Paul is, why I'm sharing all these examples with you today. In these few verses, Paul is speaking to the churches at the same level. Paul was a Jewish man. He was a scholar of the law. He was part of the judicial system. He also was the one who stood against the preaching of Jesus of Nazareth. And then he came to know Jesus. And then he became an advocate, I should say, a spokesperson for Jesus, and not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And this letter that he writes to the church in Corinth, in fact, they are Gentiles. They are outsiders. And the challenge that Paul is offering them, and at the same time speaking to the Jews back in Jerusalem, who hold the annual conference in their hands, encouraging them to embrace the change. Because these Jewish bodies in Jerusalem were very much thinking on only one aspect of life, that Jesus only came for the Jews. Hence, the good news of the gospel needs to be shared only within the Judean territory. And what Paul has done, he just left that boundary. And he went out to Gentiles. They were not in the plan. 
Are they? They began to question. The higher authorities, maybe just like bishops and district superintendents in Jerusalem, they had their cabinet meeting. And to such people, Paul is writing, do not lose the main thing. Let the main thing be the main thing. And I think in verse 22 and 23rd, he comes out openly and says, the only thing that matters is how you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he shares his challenges, what he has gone through. First of all, he says that, yes, I was born a Jew, which means that I'm circumcised, I have learned the Ten Commandments, I know the Pentateuch, I know what it means to come to the Lord's uh, presence every Sabbath day, what it means to bring sacrifices, burnt offerings and peace offerings and thanks offerings and sin offerings. He is very well, well immersed in that tradition. But he said, all that changed. On the road to Damascus, a transformation took place and I became what God wanted me to be. I became the one who will speak on behalf of Christ, not only to the people of the law, but to each and everyone. Like he said, I became everything to everyone. Many times around um, our house, Frank and I, since we have lived uh, and been raised by two different uh, kind of lifestyles. Um, Frank always asks me that my, my aspect of patience and peace uh, with uh, other religions, how was I raised? We often reflect on that. Frank has been raised in a very conservative Christian atmosphere. And here I am. My dad was a federal employee. We moved from one place to the other. I had all the Hindu friends and Muslim friends and Sikhs and who knows what else. Any religion I was very well exposed to. And he often asks me, did you participate in their uh, worships or celebrations? I said, yeah, back then I didn't know any be anything better. I did that. I took part of all their celebrations and it really enriched me, it educated me why my faith is important and different, powerful, comforting than what all that is going on. And that's exactly what I hear when Paul says that I became everything to everybody. Why? Because he says, all I want to do is share Christ with them. So friends, there is a time to be like other people. As he became Jew for the Jews, a man of law for those who lived under the law. And then he says that there were others who were not under the law. Now these are the Gentiles who didn't even know what it meant to be under the law. And he said, I became for them a person who lived without the law, but I was still under the law of Christ. And to the weak, he said, I became weak. I became all things to all people. What a picture of a typical church. Nowadays, churches are dying. Either they are dead or dying, and maybe as more and more gray hair dominant, dominate the congregation, the issue in front of the churches is how are we going to survive a few years from now? Will we be in existence? And there is only one problem that you and I are facing in this challenge. And it's very clear. It just came to me as I was reading through this 
and reflecting from the thoughts from different commentaries, that we as Christians have become people who want to share their church with others. Come to our church. We have this program, we have that going on, we do this, we do this, we are involved in mission giving, we are involved in children's ministry, we give church to the people. And you know what? That scares the people. They don't want to work with you. You are already offering them a work mode. When you come to our church, you will be doing this and this and this and this. And they shy away. Instead, the main challenge that Paul says to the church in Corinth is, instead of offering them the church, offer them Christ. Sounds familiar? You are United Methodists. When John Wesley in 1775 or so, whenever he sent Thomas Cook from England, and this is a famous painting you might see in many uh, United Methodist churches. As he was coming to America, John Wesley is standing at the coast, touching the boat and telling Thomas Cook, give them Christ. Maybe somehow or other we at McDowell Church are in the mode of offering the church to the people, like any other church. And when you begin to offer the church to people, they don't want that responsibility. And sometimes that change inside the church makes them fear for their life. Instead, Paul says, we are called to offer Christ. Give them Christ. Give them the gospel. What are, let me see, what am I doing? Make it more personal and then you can apply yourself. What am I doing to offer Christ to people? What is my approach to take the gospel to those who have not heard it before. People are looking in these times of anxiety, the only encouragement people have is that God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. But for them to know that God is on the throne, somebody has to tell them the good news how you do it, Paul gives you a plan. Paul says that if you are a person of law, transform yourself within that law. Become the person who is obedient to the voice of God, who follows the path of righteousness closely who does the prayer time, who offers the sacrifices, who comes to the Sabbath, who celebrates the high days, noon days, evening that time. Be the person of the law and let people know why you are doing this. If you are not the person of law, then become one. The one who doesn't know the law but who exists under the law of the living God. And the law of the living God, we already know that love your God with all your heart, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is not this big law or Pentateuchs or all those law books that go along with the Jewish faith. Paul says, let me simplify for you. If you are not a person of law, then don't be that person. If you can just do these two things, knowing the Lord and loving your neighbor, that's enough. Live that faith. It's in the living of that faith 
that you are becoming a transformed person and you are transforming others. And thirdly, Paul says, if you are a weak person, then those who are in faith, they need to be with the weak people. Now, the norm in uh, Corinth was that um, they were idol worshippers. Uh, they worshipped Artemis and all those goddesses. And uh, the sacrifices of the animals were made in those temples, and then that meat was sold in the market. So if you wanted to eat meat, you would buy from that temple. And Paul writes in his letter to the Corinth, Corinthians that if you are a believer and you are buying the meat from that shop, then the other one who's not a believer observes you, that's the weakness right there. What kind of impact will you leave on him? And so there is an aspect of sacrifice that is involved. Paul calls us to be a little bit sacrificial for the sake of those who are still growing up. I have become all things to all people. You know what, it reminds me of moms. They become everything to everybody at home. And that's what Paul wants us to be, a symbol of love, a symbol of comfort, a symbol of outreach, a symbol of concern, and the one who doesn't know what to do, how to do it, but still ends up doing it. That's the imagery he leaves for us. How is it with our church? In today's challenging times, yes, as I mentioned that, who knows after this pandemic takes its toll on human lives and our nation, our state, our community, where we will be and what kind of trauma we would have gone, by in, gone through by that time. But during all this time, the health of the church matters. Our faith matters. Your standing under the shadow of the cross matters. And in Paul's opinion, that's all that you are called to offer. That's all God desires from you. Don't offer people the church but offer them Christ. And may your faith continue to flourish each and every day. That becomes your calling, that becomes your aim of faith administratively, theologically, pol uh, politically. Whatever exists in church, leave that aside. All that matters is your faith. God has called, as yes, Paul was called on the road to Damascus, he took the challenge. He went to the Gentiles, not his own people, preached to the others who didn't know about Jesus. I hope and pray that your life's path leads you to the places like Paul did. He traveled all around the Mediterranean, all the way up to Turkey and Greece and uh, unknown places. All the difficulties of the challenges that he faced, shipwrecks and um, snakes wrapping around his arms and so on and so forth, besides his own people, everywhere he went, the Jewish people would come there and make a riot and demonstration. Life wasn't easy for him. And it's not easy for me also when I preach the gospel. But that is your calling. That's what God has called you to do, share. Christ. Another assuring him because he lives.
the word of god has been spoken and shared with us the bond of love has been renewed between god and us and with each other let us live with others as peacemakers the presence of christ in us gives us the taste that the world waits for we go out to share our faith with others with the help of the holy spirit amen <laughs>